Good morning, church. Welcome to FCC Grayson. We are so glad you decided to join us today. If it's your first time with us, we encourage you to go to the URL at the bottom of the screen and fill out a connection card so that one of our staff members can reach out to you during this week. If you're on Facebook, we'd love for you to share this video or start a watch party with some friends so that more people can experience this service with us. And if you're over on YouTube, just like the video and subscribe to our channel. But before we get into today's service, we just wanted to say Happy Mother's Day. Whether you have children of your own or you're a motherly figure to someone in your life, we wanted to say we celebrate you today and we love you. Enjoy the service. Precious blood. 
thank you so much for this reminder that if we just turn our eyes to Jesus, if we just look at him and keep our eyes focused on him, that um, that's all that matters, God. I know that when we look to Jesus, um, all of our fears are stripped away, all of our worries are taken away, and we're reminded, we're reminded of the sacrifice that he made for us so that we may live, and so that we may live life abundantly. So, God, we just thank you so much, and we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died for us. And I just pray that all of the songs that we have been lifting up to you today have been glorifying to your name and pleasing to your ear, God. And uh, we just love you so much, and I pray that we can continue to look to you, God. And I pray that if we have been struggling with that, that you help us remember to turn our eyes to you. But we love you and we thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in, it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to First Church. My name is Ben James. I'm the pastor here. Uh, first off, happy Mother's Day uh, to all of you mothers out there. We hope that you're having a great day and um, hopefully that, that your families are celebrating you and, and you're not cooking today unless um, it could lead to disaster for somebody else cooking in your household. But happy Mother's Day nonetheless. I want to give you an opportunity, remind you here on the bottom of the screen, uh, for giving options, want to continue to encourage you guys to be faithful in your giving. If you're watching, I, I like to issue this reminder from, from time to time as we're in this online world right now. If you are watching us and you're uh, part of another church, uh, you know, you go and when you can attend church, you're part of another church family, but you're watching us, I encourage you, give faithfully to your local church. Uh, all churches need uh, the support because we're continuing kingdom work. Uh, but if you go, if you want to give to us this morning, you can go to fccgrayson.com backslash give. Uh, if you're not comfortable doing that, our physical address is also on the screen, 287 Pomeroy Street in Grayson. Uh, you can send, you know, you can mail in your tithe and your offerings to that physical address and we will receive it here as well. Uh, if you want to, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter. We're going to be in chapter 2 again this morning. 
And I just, um, as you're turning, I, I kind of want to give you just a little bit of a glimpse into uh, maybe the quarantine life of the James family. The one thing that, that we've noticed is that our to-do list and kind of our maintenance list and the project list at the James household has, uh, it, it's increased in size. It's gotten a little bit bigger in scope, but we've actually been able to uh, cross off a few of the to-do list and the, the projects that we've had that's kind of piled up over the years. And, you know, now we're, what we're finding is that, uh, you know, our, our plants, my outside plants, they're, they're looking a little bit better this year. They're looking a little bit healthier than what they have in years past. My, my lawn looks fantastic now, as long as I can catch enough of a break in the rainy season that we're having here in the Amazon, apparently. Uh, but, you know, the cars are staying a little bit cleaner than what they normally do. The house is staying a little bit cleaner than what it normally does. The, uh, the laundry uh, is getting done more regularly and, and things are finding their way in place. It, have you ever noticed, and maybe this is just our household, but it's not a problem necessarily washing the clothes and drying the clothes. It's not even a, a, an, an issue to fold the clothes, but why is it so difficult that once you're done folding them to actually put them away? You know, to hang them up, to put them up in, you know, in the dresser. It's just like, no, they're here on the couch. They're good. We can just live off of this space right here. If you fold it on a table, no, they're good right there. But, you know, and we're actually finding that we're eating better. You know, we're, we're cooking more often. We're eating uh, better, spending more time around the family dinner table. And, and all of these things are taking place because we're staying home more. Life isn't quite as hectic in a lot of ways as what it has been, um, you know, here recently and what it has been for years, maybe, for some of us. But what I'm learning is, is that the hecticness, the, the busyness of life, um, what I used to attribute when my priorities were out of whack, whenever I would look at things like projects around the house or doing things, dedicating more time to the family or dedicating more time to God, being in his word, praying more often and just focusing on him more, what I used to blame on hecticness and busyness and the craziness of life and any other nesses that I could think of to say here is not necessarily, I'm, I'm finding that that's not necessarily the case because now the hecticness has been stripped away. Uh, some of the craziness has been stripped away. A lot of the busyness has been removed, but there's still this internal struggle that I'm finding not only within myself, but within my family and many of you that I've talked with too, that you're still facing this inner battle, this, this fleshly um, battle of trying to dedicate yourself more to God and focus more on Him. And you may be struggling with that. And I've, I've found that, you know, all of this, all of these things, you know, I, Pastor Josh met a good friend of mine up here at First Baptist Church in Grace, and I think it was a couple weeks maybe into the stay-at-home uh, order that, we, that we've kind of been under for a couple months now. He posted something on social media that said, you know, I thought that all of the the reorganization and the projects around my house, all of those not getting done were, were a result of my busy schedule. And he said, yeah, turns out I was wrong because they're still not getting done. But whenever we begin to look at these things, we've blamed busyness, we've blamed hecticness, we've blamed chaos and craziness in our lives. And it's been easy to do that because we've never slowed down. But now that we've slowed down, what we're finding out is these were actually uh, fruits of the problem, and they weren't necessarily roots of the problem. And, and allow me to kind of unpack that just a little bit. See, when we deal with the fruit of the problem, if we just remove the fruit, then it's no longer visible. We're thinking, hey, this is good. We've gotten, you know, we've taken care of this problem solved. And maybe it is for a little bit. Maybe that, that sin in your life, that busyness, maybe that distraction, those types of things, maybe they are what's initially causing that. And so you remove that, and maybe for a little bit, things like, man, I, I, I've always wanted to spend more time in God's Word, and, and now that I've removed this busyness and this craziness from my life, maybe for a couple of weeks it did. Maybe you did find yourself in God's Word more. Maybe you did find yourself praying a little bit more. Maybe you did focus on Him more than you've ever focused, but maybe you're in that situation now where slowly but surely you're kind of, your, kind of feeling yourself falling back into that, that place in your life where 
the priorities off where other things seem to be taking the place of the times that we, we started this thing spending seeking God. We started this thing reading our Bible, spent this time and dedicated this amount of time on our knees in prayer. Maybe now though that's being filled with something else other than times with God. And, and here's the example I use, and if you're part of the First Church family and you've heard me speak in springs leading up to this, this is not a new example to you. And, and I know I'm going to get hate mail for this because I get it every year and I understand it. But this year, um, I'm going to ask you to send all of the facts about dandelions and all the facts about how much good that they do, because I know that they do. I really do. Uh, but I'm going to ask you to email that to our complaint department. And that's headed up by two individuals, Greg Cherry and Billy, Greg Cherry and Billy Murray. Um, they're, they're going to take responsibility for responding to everyone's mail. So if you, uh, you know, post something on social media, make sure you tag those gentlemen in there and they'll, they'll get back with you as soon as they possibly can. But, you know, my arch nemesis uh, is dandelions because I, I love keeping my lawn looking nice. I love being out there on my mower. I love pulling my wife and daughter outside once I'm done to look at the lines in the front yard because, you know, in springtime, all of a sudden you get these these dandelions that pop up and, and they ruin the look of your lawn. Uh, so I go out there and I mow and, and dandelions gone. And then the very next morning I can get up, go outside and enjoy a cup of coffee and there mocking me is dandelions once again. And the reason for that is because, you know, my moment of satisfaction, my moment of triumph and victory is short lived because I've only removed the fruit or the evidence of the problem. You see, the dandelions come back because there's a root system there. And it's the same with problems in our lives, with issues in our lives. And when we think about our uh, priorities and our dedication and our focus on God, whenever we start taking these things like hecticness, busyness, craziness, when we blame it on that and then that fruit is removed, we're still finding that we're struggling with these things eventually. Why? Because they're fruit. There's still a root system that's planted inside of us that eventually it's going to resurface and we're going to have to deal with it again. So in this passage of you know, for, or First Peter chapter 2, I believe that Peter gives us some indications of what the root of the problem is and how we can deal with this when it comes to our priority as believers being on God and Him alone. First Peter chapter 2, we're going to start by reading verse 4. Coming to Him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense." They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy." Pray with me this morning. God, we are grateful, uh, just so very thankful again to be in your presence, to be in your word. Uh, thankful for the time of worship that we had, the time of, of communion and, and partaking and remembering of your sacrifice that you made on Calvary's cross. God, I ask that now as we enter into this time in your word, that you would open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds uh, to receive what you want to speak to us this morning. God, I pray that your word convicts us, it challenges us, it brings us comfort. God, I pray that in every heart that hears my voice this morning, that your work would be done through your word. 
God, I pray that you use me. I pray that you speak through me. Holy Spirit, please use my voice to speak your words this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So out of this passage this morning, I want us to look at three things that Peter tells us here. First, keeping God as our focus, building together as a family, and proclaiming Him to others. I believe these are the three priorities that we see in verses 4 through 10 in this second chapter of 1 Peter. And I think it's three priorities that no matter where we're at in our spiritual walk, no matter what type of situation, whether sail, uh, seas are smooth or whether we're in the midst of a trial, I believe that these three priorities should always remain top priorities in our life because I think that it helps us to keep focus on both the great commandment of loving God and loving others and also the great commission which is to go and win and disciple the lost. But the first thing I think we see this morning is that we need to keep God as our focus. And we're going to spend a little bit more time on this first one than what we are the other two because quite honestly if we don't find ourselves keeping God as our focus, then the other two aren't going to be nearly as effective in our lives, and it's, it's really not going to matter that much. If God's not the focus of our life, uh, all of these other things really aren't going to matter that much. But the, the thing that we need to understand is that our relationship with God needs to be at the center of everything we do. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, but we need to continually have this in front of us and understanding that our relationship with Jesus Christ is the most important thing in our lives, period. Nothing else is even close to the importance that Jesus should be playing in our life. If he's not the center of your life this morning, my friends, you're off track. If he is not the center of your focus, then you're wandering down a dangerous path. Even if he's in the peripheral, even if you're sitting in your house, maybe you're there because your parents are making you or because your spouse expects you to, or maybe you just feel like it's Sunday morning and that's what you need to be doing. If Jesus Christ is not the center of your life this morning, then you are simply playing church no matter where you're at, whether we were in this building together or if you're at your home. If Jesus Christ is not the center of my life, not the center of your life, then we're off track. If your devotion to him is lacking, then we're falling short. Let's, let's never forget what the book of Revelation chapter 2 says to us here. So I'm going to turn just a few pages over to my right, go to Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. Jesus says to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and that you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Think about that for a minute. He's writing to the, or he's, ta he's speaking to the church of Ephesus here, and he's saying, You're working hard for me. You have been through trials, and you've been faithful and persevered through those. You have stood for the truth, and you have stood against false teachers. But here's what I have against you, that you have left your first love. Guys, if we're doing all of these things, but we are not keeping Jesus Christ as the center, the priority, and the focus of our lives, then we're in the same state as the church at Ephesus at this moment. We need to repent and return back to the first works, which is keeping your focus on Jesus Christ and keeping Him as your primary and your first love. Now, Peter in this passage, I believe, gives us a couple ways that we can keep our focus on Jesus Christ. And the first one is in verse 4. It says, coming to Him. Now, let's look at that real quick. Coming to Him. That tense of coming to Him in verse 4 is not just a one-time event. It is a continual 
ongoing, daily, coming to the feet and coming to the foot of the cross and coming to the Savior on a daily, consistent basis. It's not just a back in, for my case, on Jan- or on December 31st, 1989, I came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Yes, that was a critical essential moment in my history and my salvation with Jesus Christ, but that's never the end. If our greatest moments of salvation, if our greatest history with Jesus Christ is always in our past, then that gives us an indication that there is a dysfunction in our relationship with Him in the now. Now, it's never wrong to talk about what Jesus has done in your past, but if what He's done in your past, if you're always looking back to the good old days, to what Christ has done as being greater than what He is doing in your life, then maybe your focus is wrong, and you need to come to Him again. Because it's not just a, I come to Him, receive salvation, and then I wait on heaven. It's a, I come to Him every day. It's a, I come to Him every moment. I come to Him every time because He is my source, He is my center, and He is my focus. Um, Andy Bernard on the show The Office, if if you're an Office fan, on the series finale, he makes this statement. He said, I wish that there was a way to know that you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. My friends, I want to submit to you this morning that there is a way to know that you're living in the good old days right now in the present. It's when you continuously and consistently come to Jesus Christ. The second thing he tells us here is to build on Him. As we look at this in, I believe it's in verse 4 where he talks about building on him. I'm sorry, verse 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. Now, Peter uses an interesting phrase here. He uses an oxymoron. And an oxymoron is when there's two, uh, you know, there's two terms together used to describe something that don't naturally go together. Uh, So, you know, a, a good example of that would be like, deafening silence. And if I'm going to use that in a sentence, I would say something like, there's always a period of deafening silence when Pastor Ben tells a joke. See, it doesn't make sense. But anyhow, he describes Jesus Christ as a living stone. And he says that are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what he's talking about is as a living stone. He gives us this image of this stone, and this is a cornerstone piece. This is something that foundation is built upon. Um, you know, it, what you build upon is only as what you're building is only as good as what you build upon. And in Matthew chapter 7, I want to read you this passage as well. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 7. This is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And he, sa- he begins to describe to us a wise and foolish builder. And he says in 7 verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. It's important that He serves as the cornerstone of our life. The very center of that. Because whatever we build on top of that is only going to be as solid as what we're building upon. But then He uses this word living, which gives this indication that, again, it's not just a moment thing. It's not just a once in a, in a lifetime type of thing. It is a continual living relationship that we need to continue to go back to as we are building our life on Jesus Christ. My friends, if you're not consistently taking time to come to Christ in personal devotion to build your life on Him, as we're commanded to do in His Word, then your priorities this morning are wrong. 
If he is not the focus and the center of your life, then your priority is wrong. Secondly, I believe that he instructs us here to build together as a family. You know, whenever I do mar premarital counseling or marital counseling for that fact, I use an example of a triangle, which many, uh, for many years this has been used and many people have used this, but I put God at the top, then I put each of the persons, the two people, their name there, and then I draw a triangle. And basically, the principle is this, the closer that these two names get to God, the closer that they get to each other. And we need to understand something, that Christianity was never meant to be walked alone. Our life, our relationship with Him, and our relationship with our brothers and sisters were meant to go together, not to be exclusive of one another. Stephen Cole says this, Peter wants his readers to see that Christianity is not an individualistic thing where we each have a relationship with God, but not with each other. We are being built together into a spiritual house in the Lord. We each need to understand that our priesthood, as Peter puts it here, is critical to what we do. This building together as a family. And, and maybe the priesthood, maybe I should say it this way, the ministry that God has given each of us to do, the calling that he's placed on your life, the spiritual gifting that he has placed inside of you is critical to the kingdom of God and it being this thing being built together as a family. Now, we need to understand that this is not exclusive to titles. It's not exclusive to being a Sunday school teacher. It's not exclusive to being a pastor or an elder or a deacon or a worship leader. It's not exclusive to a title. It is something that should flow out of your life as a result of your relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to know our identity in Him because it was never intended for us to live as a Lone Ranger Christian. Now, if you're in your early 30s or below, take a moment, Google the Lone Ranger and figure out what I meant by saying that right there. But we're meant to be attached to the body. As Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians, that every part of the body has a purpose in the building up and the extending of God's kingdom. My friend, you who are listening to me right now, you are a spiritual gifted believer in Jesus Christ if you know him as Savior and Lord. And the work that he has purposed for you to do is critical regardless if you have a title or not. The work that you have to do is just as important, maybe even more so than the work that I have to do. And I'm the one that's up here talking to you. It is not title exclusive. You need to know your identity in Jesus Christ. And we need to build together on the living stone of Jesus Christ. Lastly, this morning, I think what we see him tell us to do is that we are to proclaim him to others. Verse 9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God has called us as believers out of this world as his people. But then he expects us to still live in this world so that we can proclaim his goodness, his mercy, his love, and his light to others around us. And not only lost people, but this serves a purpose. When we proclaim him in our world, when we proclaim him in our lives, then that encourages our brothers and sisters in Christ, and that shows the light into a dark world. It testifies of his goodness, his mercy, his grace, and how he can take a lowly, wretched sinner like myself and he can turn me around and promise me an eternity in heaven and give me hope. That is a testimony that should encourage the hearts of believers and should show light into the darkest places. Our biggest opposition, and here's, here's a big thing, because now is one of the greatest times in history to share your faith. And if you're not doing it, start. Because now I've never seen in my lifetime a better opportunity for people to be willing to at least have gospel conversations and hear the gospel goodness of Jesus Christ. But the biggest opposition that we have to sharing our faith to a lost and dying world is that we live in fear of rejection. Here's the remedy to that. Here's the beautiful part about that. It's not you. Their salvation is not dependent upon you. 
If they reject it, it's not about you. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't strive for excellence in the way that we present the gospel, in the way that we live the gospel, the way that we talk to people and treat other people. We need to be as excellent as we can be, excellent as we can be in those areas. But the reality of it is it's God who saves. It's God who leads men to repentance. It's God who draws their hearts. He may use us as a voice, but they are, if they reject, if there's a rejection in a gospel conversation, they're not rejecting you. So why would we be fearful to share our faith? What other hope should we or could we extend to someone other than the hope that is found in Jesus Christ? So in conclusion this morning, I want to ask you these questions. Have you truly believed in Him? Do you not only call Him your Savior as a once, as a one-time experience, but you also consider Him your Lord? That is an ongoing, you living your life for Him. If you said yes to that, then the next question I have is, is He the focus of your life? Because if he's not, if he's not at the center of your life, if he's not at the center of everything you do, if you don't focus on him, then you're, going, you're off track. You're going astray. Also, are you part of building something as a family? I know it's really hard for us to talk and, and wrap our minds around connectivity as a body right now in this time of isolation, but understand something. You were never meant to walk this thing alone. God is wanting to build something through you and a family of believers. And lastly, are you living a life that proclaims His goodness to others? Are you sharing His goodness? Are you encouraging your brothers and sisters with proclaiming His goodness? Are you reaching out to the lost, the dying, the sin-filled world that we live in? Are you proclaiming Him to those who are lost or dying and who are set for an eternity with hell because they do not know Jesus Christ? If you, if you answer no to any of these, then I want to challenge you this morning. Spend some time with God. As, don't even wait till I'm done. Spend some time with God now. Reset Him as your focus. Be a part. Be a part of building something as a family of believers. And make sure that you are proclaiming Him and His goodness with your life. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, I, uh, I just I thank you for this word this morning. I hope that um, it's challenged hearts. God, I know it's challenged mine. Father, I pray that if, if we call ourselves believers and we, uh, we call you Lord and Savior, that God, if we're not focusing on you, that we, we make that adjustment, that we repent and we turn ourselves back towards you being the center of our lives. God, if, if we call you Lord and Savior and we are not a part of a family building something, I pray that you would lead us and convict us and guide us into coming together and connecting with a family to build your kingdom. And Father, if, uh, if, if we call you Lord and we call you Savior, but God, we're not proclaiming you to others, whether it be encouraging brothers and sisters in Christ, proclaiming you or, or not proclaiming you to a lost and dying, sin-filled world and, and the people who are lost in it. And God, I pray that you convict our hearts and challenge us of these things right now. God, I, uh, I pray for every, everyone listening that, Lord, that we would grow closer to you than we've ever been before. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us this morning at FCC Grayson. Be sure to subscribe to our email, follow us on social media, um, so you can stay up to date with everything that we have um, happening throughout the week. On Mondays, we've got Live with Pastor Ben. Wednesdays, we have Live Prayer Evening. And on Fridays, we have um, a Live Worship Night. Um, so we would love it if you could join us for any and all of those things. FCC Kids, be sure to watch our lesson for today. Um, you can find it over on FCC Kids' Facebook page and probably down in the comments right now. I've probably posted it by now. Um, also, FCC Youth, we will see you back here this evening for your lesson this week and for the Zoom calls. Um, we hate that all of this is online right now, especially with kids and youth. It, it's so hard, but we're so thankful that we can still send out lessons and we can still meet throughout the week, um, even if it's on Zoom calls or on Facebook Lives. We love the time we get to spend with you all. 
Um, and we can't wait to see you back here next week.